Everyone, it's seven o'clock. I'd like to get started. Uh, at this point in time, I'll call it together the May 4th, 2023 uh, school committee meeting. If you would join me in standing, I will take the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one, one nation under God, indivisible, liberty, and justice for all. You know, it's just in time. Yeah. All right, this evening we have a consent agenda posted as well as the minutes from our April 13th, 2023 meeting to oath the bills and payroll. And so, our motion to accept. Motion, to accept. motion made by Ms. Gold, seconded by Second five. Mr. Marius. All those in favor, and keep saying aye. 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 Set. This is our first opportunity for interested citizens. If there's anybody with us this evening, person. Perhaps not, or at home that has uh, questions, concerns, or comments. We'll take a brief pause to see. Do not so, have any raised hands. Perfect. Okay. Uh, we'll move into our recognition portion of the evening. Um, so, uh, Littleton Middle School um, representative from the New England League of Middle Schools will recognize the Littleton Middle School and rewarding them with a Spotlight School Award. I see Jason coming to the podium to fill us in. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, thank you, everybody. Um, Jason Webster will be joining us, who is who is with the New England Middle Schools to to honor. I, I gotta I gotta tell you that you know, there aren't a lot of awards that middle schools get, but to get this one is really really means something. Um, we've had it before at Littleton Middle School, but but the work that we've done over the last three years. To just take where we were and, and, and go even further. I'm really incredibly proud of our staff and, and honored to be recognized uh, by this because this is this is my first time, you know, uh, with this award. So um, Jason, it, you know, asked if, if he could be here as well as Jeff. Thank you guys. Um, I'll turn it over to you. All right, great. From one Jason to another, thank you. Good to see you. Um, everybody, hear me okay over there? Yes. Yeah. You all right, great. I'm also joined by uh, Jeff Rodman. He's our executive director, and I believe he was on the visiting team uh, that uh, came to Littleton. And I will say, actually, when I first met Jason, I think it was right before you had stepped into your principalship. I think you were an assistant principal when I came uh, three years ago. Uh, so you, you've continued on. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, but no, it's it's been uh, it's been wonderful to be able to see the growth of the school. You've done a wonderful job, uh, and um, you know just quickly, uh, you know at, at the New England Middle Schools, we really look for opportunities to highlight schools that um, excel in uh, a number of different areas for middle level education. Uh, whether it becomes you know things like uh, having students and teachers that are engaged actively in, in purposeful learning. We talk about curriculum that's challenging and integrative, uh, you know, multiple learning and teaching approaches. We look at uh, the teaming strategies, the vision, um, you know, and really it comes down to leadership that's committed to um, the middle level learner. And when, uh, when Jeff and the team came to visit Littleton, uh, they really were impressed, uh, had a wonderful visit um, I wasn't able to make it this time, but some of the highlights from the visit was really, uh, first and foremost, a great sense of pride. Uh, school pride from the students and staff uh, was resounding. Um, consistently positive learning environment. Strong and cohesive special education team and also uh, well-documented student support team, which emphasized uh, tier two learning supports um, and, and communicated those very well. Um, another strength, actually, I asked Jason if it was okay, uh, when we had our recent uh, annual conference, um, we, uh, another uh, member of our um, board and I presented on social emotional learning and student advisories. And uh, one thing that we felt uh, Littleton hit out of the park was uh, the advisory uh, program that Jason uses. It's thorough, it's consistent, um, it's aligned with the vision, mission, and, and core values of the school in the district. Uh, and it was one of, uh, there were four schools that I used, and, and Littleton was one of them, uh, that we used to kind of present examples of what a, a working advisory looks like. Um, and so it's nice to know, and I'm going to do the bragging for Mr. Everhart, that uh, you know, his school is positively affecting other schools. 
um, because we had a packed house there and, and they really were appreciative of the, the work that went into, um, you know, it's a little to middle school. And so, uh, you know, I, I think that he's done a wonderful job. The staff has done a wonderful job. I know, I don't know if Jeff has anything he'd like to add as far as the visit, but, um, he came away with, uh, as well as Tim, uh, Phelan, I believe who's a principal in Connecticut, uh, came away with a really strong feeling for a school that's doing a lot of great things. There's always room for growth, but uh, that's part of our job. We're lifelong learners. And uh, I just am really happy to be here tonight to, to uh, recognize the hard work of Jason and his staff. And, and you know, it, it was just it was a slam dunk. So congratulations to, to Jason and, and uh, the crew over at Littleton Middle School. Jeff, is there anything you want to add? Just congratulations, Jason. We thoroughly enjoyed the day, and you are a model of schools. Uh, congratulations. Well, thank you both very much for taking the time and, and, and speaking to us today. Um, none of this would have been possible without our staff. Uh, every day they show up committed to do what they do. And I try to put a vision forth, and I try to implement things, but at the end of the day, it's the execution that makes this what it is. And our students come in supported by an incredible community, the families. I've said it for years and I will continue to say it is the best group of families I've ever worked with. I've never met a group of people more supportive. COVID was an amazing experience to see just how supportive they were. And it has continued even into recent events. And I cannot imagine being anywhere else. So thank you both. And, you know, a big thank you to my staff who, who, who does do the work and, and has the dedication that, that, that we're trying to push forward. So thank you, Jason. And thank you, Jeff. I recognize that. Um, it means a lot to me and to us. All right, thank, thank you. you. Well done. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Yeah, well done. All right. Um, at this point in time, I'd like to recognize Mr. Austin for his years of service uh, with the school committee. So uh, elections are this Saturday. We encourage everyone to go out and vote. Um, Brad has decided that uh, three years was not enough. <laughs> it's only three years. <laughs> um, but but job well done. And I, I have a, a couple of remarks here for Mr. Austin, if you guys would uh, would humor me. So um, reflecting back on the three years that Brad served, um, I think you probably decided to run for school committee or get involved with in school committee, maybe as the world was shutting down and it was only supposed to last for two weeks. Yep. And then um, we, we, you sort of walked into five or 600 people on a Zoom meeting and, uh, you know, school committee meetings that went until the wee hours of the morning. Granted, we were all on those meetings, but um, Brad was one of the panelists. So that was a, a tough way to get started. And, um, but you didn't know anything different. So it made it much easier. Um, so that was the easy version. That was <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's and nice enough for sure. One of the things that I, um, learned a lot from you as you, you often told me as you said um brad reminds me that we always don't have to agree yeah. um we can talk it out in public session we can make our points we can vote and we can accept the outcome of the committee as our own um brad was is a true professional when it comes to integrity of service about self so i want to everyone knows that but i just wanted to say that publicly um during your tenure in school committee we successfully implemented a hybrid schedule during COVID and advocated for a safe return to school. Um, I think you became the sensation of the Littleton Moms Facebook group <laughs> with your pie in the face backdrop that was nice. and slipping COVID bingo words into the conversation. Um, you helped advocate for optional masking when deemed appropriate in conflict with the Board of Health, which was awkward at times. Um, you supported the school start time project, which um, was all coming together as part of this meeting. So that's great. You were a huge help with the negotiation of the Littleton Teachers Union, which again is is um, coming to a close. So that was, I mean, that's, as being able to kind of test you, that's a heavy lift. Um, so I want to thank you for that in particular. There's some big shoes to fill with the work that you did with the CPAC group. Um, not, not an official subcommittee um, on the agenda every week, but it seems like almost every meeting you had an update for us. So that was excellent. Again, um, you were sort of the uh, senior person on the policy subcommittee. So we'll, when we reorganize, we'll have to think about that. And of course, um, just like to note that you're never afraid to ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> so um, 
On, uh, on behalf of the Town of Littleton School Committee, we present to Brad Austin um, in recognition and appreciation for your dedication and commitment to our students as serving as clerk and a member of the school committee for the past three years. I have a question. <laughs> no, it's been an honor. And it's uh, been a little joy. Parts have been. Parts are awful. <laughs> Parts are awful, but it's but it's been a pleasure working with y'all. And uh, <laughs> um, and uh, no, this is important work, and it was an honor to be able to do it. We we're lucky to have you. Yes, we were. Thank you, Brian. Yeah, thanks. An honor to sit beside you and get high in the face. There's a lot of high. For two of us, someone should have played. <laughs> Bye. Hey, by design. Um, <laughs> that's why you're the chair. <laughs> so, I'll look at John's notes here. Here we go. So, um, also, we we're going to recognize uh, John this evening, um, who can't be here just yet because he's at a track. He's at a track meet. Senior meet. Senior night. Yeah. Senior, Senior night. night. Okay. Um, in the event that he walks in late, joins us, we have something to recognize him. Otherwise, we can do it at our next meeting. But he did pass along the student representative's report, which I've got the notes on, which I'm happy to share with everyone if that's quite all right. So, Shaker Lane, thank you to the families, staff, and school committee members, um, and Superintendent Clenchy for coming out to celebrate Spring Fest last Friday evening. Uh, they had an incredible turnout, lots of fun um, had by all, especially for the kids who were able to pie Mrs. Kane in the face. Brad and Neil as well. Um, and Justin. I took a few. Um, thank you again to the PTA for, for providing a delicious teacher appreciation lunch for the Shaker Lane staff. It's always a kind of gesture and it's appreciated by all. At the Russell Street School, students and staff at Russell Street had a smooth transition back to school after spring break. Littleton Country Gardeners were at Russell Street on April 28th for their annual Arbor Day celebration. Each third grader received a service berry tree to take home and plant. Hopefully those go well. Um, today, there was a Star Wars theme in the building to celebrate May the 4th be with you. Tomorrow, we look forward to Cinco de Mayo, all types of celebrations over there. Um, in coming weeks, the Russell Street students will be taking their math and MCA, uh, math MCAS tests. At the middle school, the eighth grade will be taking their science MCAS tests, May 10th and 11th. All grades will be taking the math MCAS uh, the 17th and 18th. In the middle school band and course will be presenting at the high school on the 24th from 6.30 to 8.30. So mark your calendars. The high school from May 2nd to May 11th, the AP exams will be happening at the high school. On May 16th and 17th, 10th grade will be taking the MCAS exams. On the 16th, um, there is an NHS blood drive starting at 8 a.m. On May 18th, the financial literacy fair will take place. Lots of effort has been um, has gone into it, and they look forward to it. So, thank you, John, for those notes. Let's toggle back to the agenda. There was some awkward silence. All right. Um, so at this point in time, I'll toss it over to Superintendent Clenchy. Um, who has some remarks and is also going to provide an update um, and some remarks about some old business as well. Sounds good. Thank you. Great job, Justin. Thanks. You covered everything, but once again, <laughs> uh, I'd like to start off by thanking our community for supporting our budget, the uh, town meeting. Uh, we appreciate your ongoing support. And uh, for all of us, uh, all of the staff, it's, it's uh, just allows us to start moving forward and planning for next year. So it's an exciting time for all of us. I'd also like to thank uh, Mia Clements for uh, singing the national anthem uh, at our town meeting. She has an incredible voice. It's just a pleasure to, to listen to her sing. And, and this is the second town meeting this year that she's uh, taking the time to come out and uh, sing the national anthem for us. So thank you very much, Mia. And our town uh, meeting uh, book, for the year, there's a picture right in front of me. And I'd like to actually congratulate and thank Catherine McDonough for, for this incredible artwork that uh, is illustrated on, on the front page of our, our town report. Incredible artist, uh, you know, it's always nice to see how, how diverse our students are and, and the gifts that they have. And, and uh, it, just incredible to, to see that kind of artwork. Speaking of our work, I'd like to thank Mrs. Hemis and all of her students for uh, 
submitting artwork for the pages within the town report. So if you haven't looked at the town report, please take some time to thumb through it and you'll see lots of artwork from our students. Very nice, very nice to, to be part of that town report, uh, not only writing sections in it, but having our students uh, displayed in the town report as well. So feel really good about that. Uh, on Wednesday, Steve, uh, Beth, Mike Lynn, Robin, and myself met with D-Bus and had a very productive meeting. And uh, I feel very comfortable uh, making a statement tonight that we're not concerned about having buses on site next year. Uh, they're very confident that they're going to have drivers to drive the buses. So I, I felt really good when I left that meeting. And uh, what a lot of you have been waiting for, we would like to uh, release the school start times for next year. And I have a letter ready to push send on that's going out to all staff and families as soon as I finish talking about this. And feel free to fill your Facebook sites up with the, the times as well. So uh, Littleton Middle School, start time 7.55, end time 2.20 p.m. Littleton High School, start time 8.05 a.m. I'm thrilled that we were able to jump over the 8 o'clock mark on that. And uh, finish time is 2.35 p.m. Russell Street School, 8.45 a.m. is the starting time and 3.10 p.m. dismissal. Shaker Lane School, 8.55 starting time and 3.20 p.m. dismissal. So there you have it, official times for, for next year. Certainly open to any comments that school committee has. Or... <laughs> I'm thrilled. I feel like we're bursting with excitement. Um, awesome. We worked really hard on this. I think our, our subcommittee, our working group worked really hard to make this happen. Thank you to everybody that <laughs> on the committee, in the town. Um, I know it's change can be hard, but this is so, so, so good for the kids. And that's the priority. This is going to make a big difference. And as we talked about going from three tier to two tier just um, sets the stage for even potentially more change in the future incrementally bit by bit uh, to get these kids more sleep and, and more academic and social and emotional advantage. So this is amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Brad? I think this is the, of all the potential kind of start times we ever saw, I think this is the best set. This is the best case scenario um, for us. I really appreciate the work everyone did on it. Thank you. Yeah. Thrilled. I mean, I feel like, uh, especially with the elections coming around, like every year, this was like, you know, a big election topic. Right. Like, well, you, if, if elected, would you advocate for start times? Well, we finally got it done thanks to the work of, of um, everyone in the room. So um, just very pleased that uh, that we're moving forward with this plan. We, we've got the funding, get the busing, get the times out. So good stuff. Mm -hmm. Anything to add? Any praise? All good? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, All right. Kelly. Just one last uh, sure. acknowledgement. This weekend is the Littleton uh, Middle School play, Forgiven a Fairy Tale. So uh, the uh, performances are May 5th, 6th, and 7th. Uh, May 5th and 6th are at uh, 7 o'clock at night. So uh, if you have some uh, free time, please come out and, and support our uh, middle school theater program. And that's it. Great. All right. Um, we'll move on to our presentation portion of the evening. So we've got uh, two presentation, well, two presentation topics. Uh, the first we're going to start with um, part two of the curriculum reports. So I think uh, Ms. Perry's up first. Um, so this is the K to 12 Health and PE Curriculum Coordinator Meredith Perry joining us, provide an update on the health and PE curriculum. Well, I'm a little bit upset that. It's not a little bit later on in the meeting, so I can't make you get up and get moving. So if you would like to take a few minutes, we can do some squats if you want. You can do some sides. That's up to you. Yeah, yeah. It's perfect. You can do the time. Right from the gym. I came from a little cross field, so that's it. <laughs> um, so yeah, my name is Meredith Perry. I have done this handful of times. <laughs> I've been here a lot longer than a lot of you. <laughs> but um, this is actually, um, it's we're in a weird pattern right now because as I was 
telling Beth before the meeting, we are partying like it's 1999 in the um, health and phys ed department because that's how old our standards are. <laughs> um, so that's just kind of where we're at. Um, we are trying to update our curriculum as best that we can with still following those standards. So we do follow the national health um, skills, which is the standards from obviously the um, national health organization, the um, CHEAP, and we follow those for PE as well um, with embedding the curriculum from the state. Um, we are connecting with the um, school resource officer, school resource officer within our curriculum as well. Um, Meg has been down into the middle school um, giving some presentations, um, talking about um, drugs and alcohol. We are again back to normal, um, still kind of making that transition, but um, keeping things clean, obviously, especially in the weight rooms and, and having them clean up the equipment, but sharing equipment again, um, hands-on learning in the health, in the health room, back to group work. Um, and so that kind of it feels more fun again. Um, we don't have to feel so isolated. Uh, we do have the universal screening. We do that in seventh grade and then ninth through twelfth. And that is a mental health screening, which screens for um, depression, anxiety, suicide. And then we do have the signs of suicide, uh, which is a different program, but still screening um, for the sixth and the eighth grade of the middle school. So those are just the things that we do annually, um, but we're obviously continuing to do those. Um, again, like I said, we are trying to update our curriculum. We are waiting for the um, frameworks to be you know, released. They It was supposed to come out in 2020 and then everything just kind of shut down and was put on hold. Um, I have been in contact with them and they just keep saying, we'll send you updates when we get them and I haven't received any. So um, we do the best we can with what we have. Um, we do uh, look at the students to see where they're at and where they need to be. Um, the beauty of our curriculum is that we can um, individualize it, um, especially in the PE, where are they, where can we go. Um, in the health curriculum, I have an objective and I say, get there. And um, we do that same thing for middle school. It you know, doesn't matter the path that they get there. As long as they get there, that's what we strive for. Um, obviously, we are focusing on social and emotional wellness for the students. We are making sure that they are um, you know, coming to school with their weight, that they um, are engaged, engaging in our classrooms um, and making sure that they, um, any struggling students, we are making sure that they are getting the support that they um, And then obviously any type of other um, UDL kind of um, instruction, we can obviously have that in there as well. Then I think oh, the, we did the, um, a few of us did culturally responsive teaching um, professional development. And as I had mentioned, we are um, incorporating the UDL into our curriculum as well. And then we are taking some online courses just to, again, stay updated with um, what, you know, other states are doing. Um, and specifically, I'm taking a course with Strength Training for Women. Um, we're trying to um, up our numbers in the strength and conditioning um, with the females, um, our students who identify as female. Um, but within that, instead of just having them in a different course, um, so that they learn more about strength training and then trying to motivate those unmotivated students, which can always be <laughs> And then here are just some pictures just so that you can see what's happening in Shaker Lane. Um, they're doing some optical courses and using their um, gross motor skills. And we have some Russell Street pictures. This one, they're doing some um, mindfulness and yoga, some stretching. And then the middle school, they have a bunch. They do a lot of uh, work together. Bridget and Greg work really well together and they um, collaborate in their classes together as well. Um, it's nice that they're, they're set up there, um, very close in proximity to so it's nice they can do these games together. Um, I know they sometimes start their classes together as well and then they, they separate. more pictures of the different activities that we do. Mm -hmm. And then at the high school, oh, just kidding, there's one more in the school. <laughs> <laughs> um, they, I know one day a week in the Fit for Life class, they do focus on meditation um, so that that can be helpful um, to some students who maybe just kind of need that deep breath. Um, so that's been incorporating to their um, weekly curriculum. And then the strength and conditioning, 
and then the um, foreground as well. Again, kind of back to normal. That's it. Good. Um, questions from I'm looking at random numbers? <laughs> 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 In <laughs> preparation, we were like, oh, you know, yeah. Brad's question. <laughs> Brad, go right ahead, bud. I do have some questions. So, um, first of all, the fact they have an updated curriculum since 1999 is shocking. And it's, it's, I, I know it's tough for you. I'm glad to hear we're supplementing it using kind of national standards. As someone who's not an expert in your field, I assume that a lot of the changes that have been taking place have been kind of um, like kind of sex ed stuff and what we want to be able to talk about when it's age appropriate to talk about yeah. on certain issues with our students. I know we have the film in middle school and start doing some of them. I wonder if if you could give us an overview of where we talk to our students about kind of sexual health, um, kind of moving through the curriculum, and also a um, couple of us heard from parents asking about. If they have questions about resources, would they direct those to you or to whom would they direct those? Yep. So any so we start in the fifth grade where they have the puberty lesson. Yep. And then as it goes through, sixth grade talks about a few things moving on, builds on through the middle school. And then ninth grade is where most of the kids get well, that's where the majority of the high school students have health is in ninth grade. If they don't get it in ninth grade, then it's we try to get them in tenth grade. Um and so then that's where it stops sure because that's the course that they take but if they were to have any questions you can absolutely send it to me or um to beth as well okay that's great thank yeah. you thanks so much another question i have sorry yeah good thank you very much thank you thank Next up, we will hear from. I said, but dressed up too, I wore a dress. That was really my idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I just saw <laughs> Okay, okay, okay. Right. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. Beth <laughs> Kelly's up. Um, let's see, six to 12 world curriculum, uh, world language curriculum coordinator Beth Kelly provide an update on the world language curriculum. Hi, I'm Hello. Liz Kelly, <laughs> um, and I thank you for inviting me um, to share with you the state of our curriculum in the world languages. Um, the, we started off with um, some staffing changes. Um, I want to recognize that Janine Allison, our French teacher at the high school, is retiring after 11 years. Um, she was able to grow our French program into a safe space for many students, offered AP French and an opportunity to take the stamp exam um, early on for students. Um, who wanted to show proficiency. And she did all this with grace and compassion. She went from four sections of French um, at one point due to debt caps and enrollment at earlier levels uh, to actually a consistent six sections for the past few years. Um, so I just want to recognize her. I do have um, some good news that um, Chris Milby, who is the middle, current middle school French teacher has, and has just completed his second year, um, he's going to be moving up to take the reins at the high school. He'd already been at our school for some observations um, and some work with vertical alignment. So we're really happy to have um, Chris at the high school. Um, and now we're in the process of looking for a middle school French teacher. <laughs> um, I do have a picture of Madame Allison and her, um, her outing last summer, which was the Tour de French Club bike ride uh, in Groton on the rail trail. That was, that was pretty fun. Yep. <laughs> Recognize some people there. <laughs> um, and I also just um, included um, our course sequence. Um, this is the fourth year of our uh, streamlined unleveled courses, um, which is something a lot of other schools are looking at doing um, in Eastern Massachusetts right now. And people have been talking to schools um, and programs like ours where we've already done it, where we don't differentiate between college prep and honors in, at the same level and instead um, incorporate um, more of the streamlined approach. Um, we also um, have really kind of nailed down our um, yearly schedule for the seal of biliteracy, which is really, um, really grown into kind of a, I guess I'll say like a routine for us where in October we start the application process for any senior um, and we hold information sessions during flex block uh, so students, seniors can find out about the seal of biliteracy. We offer a testing date for anyone. Uh, any seniors who want to test um, in January, we offered one on Saturday morning. Uh, this is a four-hour test. 
um, for most students. Um, and we also offered one after school um, on one of the half days. Um, we then offered retests on certain sections where students um, didn't quite meet the bar. So we offered uh, an additional time for that. Um, and right now we're offering what we're calling like the PSAT um, of uh, the Seattle Open Literacy Testing or Proficiency Testing, where we're offering it to our junior world language classes. Um, some students, um, I actually offered, I offered it today in my Latin class, and I have one student who, who's now already eligible for next year. So that's nice, but it also gives kids a chance to get used to the test format um, and have some practice and kind of for us too, to get some data as to where students are with proficiency. Um, and so we're, we're offering that right now in the junior world language classes. Um, then we go through the whole uh, awards process. Students get a seal on their diploma, our graduation cord at the awards night. Um, and I will give you our results for our seniors. Our current seniors um, graduating this year with the seal of biliteracy will be um, in French, Jack Hornicola. In Latin, Jack Hornicola, again. <laughs> um, Maeve McCabe. Owen McNeil, uh, who has earned the seal with distinction. And in Spanish, uh, Arab, Aurora, Sophia Black, Tyler Edwards, and Arian Kulkarni. So we're proud of those students. Um, one thing I forgot to mention, because I kind of went out of order here, is I want I did want to talk about the um, unlevel courses again. And one of the things that I'm really happy about with this is that um, I think it's a good start for us to make sure we're offering languages to all learners. Um, as according to our new curriculum frameworks, sorry, Meredith. Ours <laughs> 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 uh, came out 2021. <laughs> um, um, according to that, um, there's an important statement that I just want to share, which is that world language is defined by law as a core discipline, and all students have a right to access world language education. Um, speaking of offerings, we are still uh, continuing to offer dual enrollment with Middlesex Community College. Um, and not really much has changed here, except that, um, again, um, I've had a lot of other uh, area schools reach out to me this year to find out about what we're doing, and uh, a lot of schools are moving to this model. And it's just a nice way for us to offer another path for students um, who may not want to uh, go for college credit through an AP course, but instead could uh, take the, what was the old level three and level four courses, intermediate, now two and three, uh, in either French, Spanish, or Latin. So we're proud of that too. We can go on to the next slide. This is just a sampling of some professional development um, that we've done over the past year or so. I will highlight uh, that Actful, which is our um, national organization, um, came to Boston um, last year, and many of us were able to attend that. That was a great opportunity. Um, quite a few of us did a book club last summer on um, the book Common Ground. So we're trying to keep up with uh, second language acquisition theory. Um, and then the other thing I'll highlight is just that we're really appreciative of the time that we've had um, on the district led, uh, the district half day, faculty led half days, um, where we have had time to become familiar with the new um, mass state world language frameworks. Um, this was a really lengthy undertaking. It was very generous of DESE for how much um, training and professional development they thought we should do to become interested uh, to learn about these. Um, there were actually 13 modules, uh, which were videos to watch. Um, and you really couldn't click through unless you listened to the whole thing. <laughs> um, and so it really took some time. There are five curriculum uh, alignment labs. Those are 90 minutes each. Um, and so there's just, um, we're, we're, still, we're still in the process. Um, our next steps, are um, really to look at um, aligning our units and courses to the new framework, but we've at least had some time to become familiar with the new frameworks through that uh, faculty-led uh, PD uh, time. That, so that was really great for us. Um, I was gonna talk on the next slide about um, what our proficiency goals are. Um, I just wanted to um, address that in, that in order to earn the seal of biliteracy, a student has to attain the level of intermediate high in a language other than English and then demonstrate uh, mastery in English as well. That's done usually on MCAS. Um, and then we offer testing for the other language. Um, so if you look at the chart that's on the left, um, it's inter uh, novice, intermediate, advanced. They need to be intermediate high. Um, and if you can see there, um, that's the number of years that um, it's sort of like, this is this is an estimation 
of how many how many classroom hours it would take to reach this. Um, but uh, Actful, our organization, again, said that in order to move from the novice level to the intermediate level, uh, to the advanced level, uh, there needs to be 135 to 150 years of classroom instruction per year. Years? Yeah, per year. <laughs> but that would be, yeah, I know, yeah, yeah. It seems that way because um, it, it really, it, need, it needs to be hours per year and it's K and that would be starting in K in, in kindergarten, um, which of course many schools don't do. So um, that's not as fun to look at. That chart. But what is fun to look at are the ice cream cones. Um, <laughs> and these, we have these in our classroom. Um, we use the images of ice cream cones to help students visualize what it means to level up. So um, a single, you know, a single cone, we talk about Kimball's, of course. Um, and, you know, getting a single scoop of ice cream is really sort of in the novice. And then as you add scoops of ice cream and toppings and, you know, sprinkles and cherries and all those things, you're really leveling up. Um, I did give you the example there. Um, in English of what uh, sample intermediate high um, descriptors are at the top for this would be for the presentational mode for, for writing um, and then um, and then an example down below where the, the mistakes are allowed but you do need details and you need supporting um, so supporting descriptors so um, this is this is a lot um, <laughs> but really what I'm, I'm just reminding us all is that more time equals higher proficiency and so for our students to reach the intermediate high rate intermediate high uh, level of proficiency is really quite an achievement considering how much time they get which is in very many hours right? in and years um, mm -hmm. of, of language study so I'm just I wanted to show you that um, I, the last couple of slides are um, pictures because everybody likes pictures. So these are some of the things that we're doing um, to develop um, students' proficiency. Uh, for us, um, at the high school in particular, the longer class periods allow for more input and more time to delve into a topic or a text uh, via a variety of activities in one class period. So by teaching for, for proficiency, we place more emphasis on time in class as opposed to time, done out, time and work done outside of the classroom. So uh, of course that changes as students move to higher levels and more um, outside work is required. Um, but these are some samples of things we've done in class this year. Um, we had um, we had reading in class. I think that's the one on the bottom right. That was um, a student grabbed a book, they, a novella they thought were interesting and actually just started reading to the rest of the class before the teacher even came into the room. So the kids are enjoying reading. Um, Mrs. <laughs> Gillen took her, um, AP, uh, AP students, yeah, uh, yes, AP class. Uh, after they completed their family and community unit, they thought it would be a great experience to share their knowledge with Spanish of Spanish with Russell Russell Street students. So they went, um, they chose a book to read, and they each read a book and did follow up activities at Russell Street. So that was a great experience. Um, that same AP class in the upper right looks like a cold day. Um, <laughs> after they completed their World Challenges unit, they actually did some cleanup outside the high school. And then um, I believe it was actually Mrs. Perry who took a picture of my middle bottom picture <laughs> of my students in a Socratic seminar, which is this one way that I've been able uh, to help students learn to communicate in a structured way without teacher interference. So we had an inner circle and outer circle, two rounds of discussion. Um, we've also, uh, many of us have offered um, upper level luncheons um, with potluck Food based on the culture studies. So we've done that in our level five classes this year. We've made, managed to include the Latin, French, and Spanish classes all together. I have um, one more slide, which are some pictures of student engagement outside of class. Um, the one on the bottom right um, is at the Worcester Art Museum, and that was a French um, group of juniors and seniors who went there to see Impressionist art. And afterwards, they had an hour long session on how to paint an Impressionist image. I thought that was pretty cool. Um, I did take students to classic day at Boston University, where we where students hear college level experts speak on a topic and interact with other Latin students from schools across Eastern and Central Massachusetts. Um, we also use FlexBlock for some more fun stuff. Brad, you noticed that before. Um, we we had students this year. We play a game called ETA in the Latin classes. And I had some students who wanted to uh, do it outside of class. They just wanted to keep playing the game. So they came, came up with their own trivia questions um, and um, answers and, and even a study guide for students. And they would come in during flex 
just on their own for fun, I guess I'll say, uh, for, for Roman trivia. I also threw in some pictures because I was lucky enough to go on this trip uh, to Spain. <laughs> I was I was not the leader, but uh, Jackie Duffy from the high school led a very large group of students to Spain in February, and I got to chaperone, and we did a lot of great things, like went on a bike tour in Barcelona, and kids climbed up on these bull <laughs> statues, and we were in front of a pyramid in Madrid, so we had a lot of fun on that. We have some upcoming trips to Europe. Um, I'm leading one next year. Uh, we're looking at reviving the exchange programs that we had in the past. Um, so we're doing lots of fun things. So I will entertain any questions. Go around the table real quick. I can start trying. Sure. Um, first, I love that the older kids are going to the Russell, Russell Street School to read to the kids. I think that's really cool. Yeah, that's the great. younger kids always love to see the older kids to mm -hmm. incorporate a language into that. Kind of gives them a really fun little taste of what they have to look forward to. So I really love I really love that you guys incorporated that. That's great. Um, yeah, it sounds like you guys are doing great. I think the only other question I had was for the the Spain trip is how are how are we funding that? Is that a hundred percent? These parents? these school these trips are not school sponsored. They um I mentioned them because I think it's just it's it is part of our community, but they're not um school sanctioned or school sponsored. Yeah. And so uh these are yeah, we they are they are funded by parents, they're optional. Um and one thing that has happened in the past is when fundraising has been attempted, um, there's some issues with that because of not being a tax exempt organization. So that that's the history that I know. I haven't had any issues with that. Kids can, kids can individually fundraise and actually some of the tour companies teach kids how to do that and offer ways for students to do that, but it is self-funded. No, I think that's what you're asking, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah I was yeah. just curious how how we're funding it because I didn't think it was a school. Um, yeah, let's see trip. But how much is it for a school for a trip to Spain? Like, what is it? It varies, but it can be like four to five thousand dollars typically for a, for a week or how long? It, it yeah, it's a, some of the trips are eight days, some are up to ten days. I think some maybe longer. I don't know about like Susan's trips. Well, yeah, twelve days, and it depends on what country you go to and all of that, of course, too. Yeah. Um. It, one thing I'll say is that the trips do include a lot and in, in that that um, I've traveled on so many of these now that it's just people, when they see the things that we're able to do on these trips, it really is a good value for the movie. Yeah. 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 Great. Thank you. School committee chaperone is what you're thinking. That's <laughs> <laughs> thinking. That's that's the last <laughs> next <laughs> Yeah. Good. No, that's Thank you. Yeah, I've got a couple questions. One, we're definitely this with Allison. Um, give her our best. Yeah. She, um, my personal um, note is Stella loved learning from her. It's really, and was able to test out <laughs> all of her French and uh, at college after that. That's so, great. I really I'll appreciate that. that. Saves a lot of money. Um, <laughs> the dual enrollment um, is another way of getting out of the table. Yes. Time. So those, you said they, are those like 201 and 202 level at the college? Um, so. It's a so, course number question, I guess. Yeah. So it depends on the school that they're going to because Middlesex doesn't label them the same way that say like larger universities do, like even state university. Right. Um, they are. Yeah, they they are. Yeah, they are the so at Middlesex it's le, it's it's level three and four. So yes. So I think it's the intermediate. Yeah, I'm trying. Yeah, that makes sense. So if you mm -hmm. if you get credit for the second of those two, then you will probably have tested out of the language requirement for most schools. Genetic. Yes. The other thing we're starting to track better, and that's another part of the deal of literacy. Uh, streamlining that I mentioned is um we're starting to get better data from students who are. Um, who are getting out of language requirements or get, or getting credits. It depends on the school for the seal of biliteracy as well. Well, that was my next thing. I'm mm -hmm. so glad one of my friends that said say was responsible for all the Yeah, people. Started. Oh, she started. She started. Started. Yep. And just, and she was telling about it at the inception. I'm just, I'm just thrilled that, that we are doing so well in it. I mean, we accounted seven or eight different students getting it. That's 5% at least of or so of our graduating class. That's, that's exceptional. It's, it's a real honor. And I'll just note that I've also, like I said, the, the Latin students always win the big awards or almost always seem to win the big awards. Um, I love seeing the enthusiasm, you know, Latin boggle and things like that. It's just, it's great to see that. I guess my last question is about the, you, you mentioned the new curriculum and kind of brag a little bit. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I'm just rubbing it in. And yeah, yeah. Rubbing. And so one of the things you raised <laughs> with your chart, you know, comparing the chart yeah. to the ice cream was the number of hours and how early it starts. Yeah. If I recall correctly, when that curriculum was introduced, one of the suggestions was um, maybe beginning earlier or beginning more intensive language study of a single language earlier. Mm -hmm. And I'm just, I'm asking, are we still comfortable with our model of sixth grade mm -hmm. with the trimesters or are so we? Pers personally, <laughs> um, personally, I would love to see language start as early as possible. It's, it's, I will also admit I've been teaching a long time now that um, it's not feasible in most communities mm -hmm. due to funding. It's, it's very few communities that are able to get to start in elementary school. The ones that do in elementary school tend to do a, 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 a flex model, which is that, you know, introduction really. Um, I would like to see us make some steps to move it lower. And I think the first step that we've actually talked about um, with Jason and Beth um, is moving um, the formal instruction to sixth grade. So that is a possibility coming up in the future um, because the, the the model that we have right now in sixth grade of exploratory isn't really helping towards proficiency because it's it's much lighter. It's we've got a lot of culture um, and it's not really language intensive in any way for the purpose of what you know, what it is. It works, but it's not actually structurally, pedagogically recommended yep. by world language people. Certainly not by Nicole, but that's <laughs> yeah, yeah. Person. yeah. But, yeah. But no, and I'm, I'm with her. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, and I guess, so that's good to know that we're thinking about it. Yeah, and, uh, that would be great. would love to watch or listen to other, and see how that progresses. That comes sure, yep. I guess I have one last question, and because it's sealed by literacy. One of the, or one of the things we've noticed about um, Littleton's changing population is that we have people entering our population yeah. who probably aren't speaking Latin at home, yes. or French or Spanish, maybe speaking other um, second or first languages at home. Are they able to get a single bioliteracy in another language, even if they don't have academic training at our school? Uh, they are, and we've been inviting them, and that's why we're really working on that outreach by having that meeting in the fall and we and, and inviting them in. Um, we have found, um, because actually Jack, who earned it in French, that's his heritage language. Um, and we've had some other students, we have two other students who are actually retesting right now mm -hmm. in French, and that's their that's their native language as well. Um, and what we're finding is that. Without the academic training, it is more difficult, and that's a good term to use, um, because of the, having to do not only speaking, listening, uh, and reading, but also the writing it tends right. to be tricky, trickier. And the bar is really high. The, the, the bar is really high for everyone. So we are working on that, um, and we are doing outreach to at least get kids to try it and test. Um, we had, um, we've had a couple others. We've had Russian, we've, you know, but, but not, there hasn't been, we have Portuguese, um, but we haven't really had a consistent group of other students yet. Although we've had more parents inquiring about it for sure, and we'll just keep following up. That was my question. If there are we trying to support students, and it sounds like we are. I appreciate yeah. that. Again, thanks. Brad, you stole all my questions, but uh, <laughs> yeah, that was a nice presentation. Sorry, I called you Beth. And I did that. I did that last time. I, oh, I saw you oh, too. My, I my apologies. I'll, I'll, I'll never do that again. Um, <laughs> question about Latin. I mean. I, I took Latin because I wasn't very good at foreign language. Um, is the Latin trend that is that gaining in popularity due to um, like the SAT testing and things like that, or is it actually fading out because it's you know not in practice sure. like a useful language? Do you mean in Littleton or yeah, in Littleton? Okay. So we've had what we tend to have is Spanish is pretty consistent, yeah. and then our Latin and our French kind of flip flop. We we've, we've really developed over the years. The, the fact that we can maintain three languages, six through 12, has been amazing and for the size of our district. And so we're really trying to focus and make that be as strong as it can possibly be. Um, and um, I guess Latin is, is I, I'm not sure exactly how to answer because it's complicated, not because it's not a good question, but um, mostly the way that Latin has been taught probably the way you learned it and definitely the way I learned it was like the grammar and yeah, building vocabulary and trying to increase your English vocabulary and help you on the SATs and your skills of analysis. There's been a big movement in the last really 25 years, but definitely the last 10 years to use active Latin is the term, not so much even spoken Latin anymore. And just, and the fact that we're going to read it, even if you're not going to speak it in class, you're going to work on reading it as opposed to translating it. 
And so there's been more of a movement to appreciate the language just for the sake of learning the language and to eventually read it. Um, and there's all these new novellas out and all these other kinds of things happening in the language to align with all the other proficiency-based pedagogy. So there is, it, it's, it's, the main thing is if a student can learn a language, if a student learns a second language, their ability to learn any other language after that is just, you know, multiplied. So, so to answer your question, I don't really know <laughs> why our, what, in general, I know somewhat why our students are taking it. I think they're interested in it. I mean, they do get to study a little Roman history, mythology, and, and all the other stuff. We do some word derivation, but we're also, not that we're abandoning that entirely, because I know kids want that, and it's fun, and it draws them in, and I love it too. But also, I'm trying to focus a lot on reading Latin as opposed to having to like parse every word and parse every sentence where it becomes like dissection. And I would like them to be able to be more comfortable and read. And that's what our test is. We, we use a different test, obviously, than the modern languages. It's just reading. Uh -huh. And so we're that's our goal. And we really try to focus on reading for the goal. Gotcha. If I can add, I, I think let's be modest. I think um, my, their reputation is to... These Latin classes are really challenging and really fun. And there's a culture at our middle schools and high schools and mm -hmm. Latin is, is something fun to study, which I've never heard anywhere else before. So <laughs> congratulations <laughs> to you and your team. It's it's Thank great you. that we have this, you know, let's study this hard language yeah. um, oh. and, and have fun doing it. it I think it's wonderful. Reputation of the teacher. Yeah, right. That's what I'm sure. If you were to add, a, not that we would have the money for it, it's feasible, but if yeah. you were to add a fourth Three. language, I'm just curious, what would that language be? Your, your personal choice. Um, I I don't I don't. It sounds weird, but I don't care. I, I mean, I no, I mean, I don't. I don't. It, it would be what the community wants and yeah. what, what we want. I I do think that some. It's it's hard to hire any language teacher, right? <laughs> it's, it's hard to find any um, yeah, any other language teacher. So um, it it would be what works for the community. I really yeah. I mean, I I think we have some solid programming now. And um, yeah. Can I ask one more call? Mm -hmm. So I know that students can take ASL through virtual high school. Mm -hmm. and they, are there yes, other, can yes. they take other world languages through virtual high yes, school? Yes, yeah. And kids have, the feedback in general has been that they don't like it as much as being in, in classroom in person. And, and one of the things we've noticed actually is, is we're really proud of those seal of biliteracy results, but they also have dipped since the pandemic. And we know it's because the kids just haven't had as much input as in Same thing. Thanks so Thanks much. So much. Yeah. 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 All right, uh, part two of the presentations. Um, up next, Superintendent Clenchy will present the 2022-2023 district slideshow. Yes, we've been uh, doing this for a number of years in our district. Uh, Somebody mentioned earlier this evening that the pictures are very effective. Pictures also say a thousand words. And it is a, a reaffirmation to, to everyone that everything that we do in our district is designed to provide outstanding learning opportunities for every child in your district. When you watch this, this video, it, it, uh, it not only reaffirms it, but it, you're going to feel good at the end of the video because you're going to see some of the things that we've done during the year, happy faces. And, the kids that are students that have a, a sense of belonging, which is so important in, in any school. So with that, well, uh, one more thing before we start, I'd like to thank Julie Lord, our, our co-leader of our tech department. She creates slideshows for us every year. So, so special thanks to Julie.
There you have it. We're looking forward to a strong finish to the end of the school year. <laughs> Perfect job, well done. Okay, um, that did bring a smile to everybody's face, Kelly. You're right. <laughs> Um, all right, so we've got a couple agenda items to get to here, the first of which is um, recommended school choice uh, slots for fiscal year 24. Superintendent Clenchy will have some recommendation for school committee approval. So there's a, a lot of numbers on this, this graph. You really just need to look at the fourth column, the last column, the fourth column is the Recommended additional seats are in red. Uh, the last column uh, depicts the number of students uh, at each grade level. If we were to move forward with the recommendation, uh, we've talked a lot about kindergarten uh, in the past couple of years. Uh, part of what I've done here is, is obviously kept an eye on our funding plan that, that we need to fund our um, change in busing. Uh, from a three tier to a two tier, so we're we're recommending six students in K and three students in grade one. And after you move from Shaker Lane School, we we do open seats, but a lot of families like to enroll their their children prior to to grade three. So even though we we open up perhaps more seats in some of those grade levels the chance of filling all these those seats is, is not high. I mean, we get a couple of students, maybe maybe none at all. So uh, if you look at our classes in, in three, four, five now, you can see that we, we do have room for five more students in grade three, four students in grade four, and four more students in grade five. Six, seven, eight, uh, we would like to open up five seats in grade seven and two seats in, in grade eight. Uh, just a bit of a backstory here. Uh, please remember during grades six and seven, we have some of our families sending uh, our students to Parker Charter. And from eight to grade nine, we have some of our families sending their uh, students or children to uh, Neshoba Tech. So those are two areas where we we lose students. And we have to keep that in mind to keep, a, keep our high school viable and we have students to offer the number of programs that we do. We look at the high school. We have a bit of a, a little bit of a dip uh, in enrollment. Uh, we're we're still you know cautious, so we're looking at uh, adding four uh, more schools of choice students to grade nine, four more to grade ten, six more to grade eleven, and six to grade twelve. And again, typically we out of out of those seats that I've listed there, twenty seats we. We may receive two students, three students, depends on the year, but uh, certainly not 20. This would uh, allow us to continue to, to build a little bit, not much. I'm, I'm gonna change that phrase and try to level out our school choice students from year to year. It's important to realize that we had six, uh, we have six students, uh, school choice students graduating this year. Next year, we have 10. Mm -hmm. and, and you can see if you look at the column before the red column, it, it gives you an, an idea of the number of student choice seats that we have. And uh, we soon will have 11 and 11 and then back to 10. So we have a, more school choice students graduating in the next four years than we typically have had in the past. Uh, more than happy to answer any questions that you may have. Got anything? No, I'm good. Brad, no questions. Vino, Stacy. I know, of course. Yeah, yeah. Um, please. I think maybe for next year, it'd be helpful to know how many classes are in each grade, so we know. Why oh, you tell you that right now? Oh, off, off the top of your head. Okay. Good to know. So kindergarten, six classes. Transition, one class. Grades one and two, six classes each. Three, four, five, six classes in each grade. Six, seven, eight, five classes in each grade. Nine, 10, 11, and 12 is impossible to tell me. I could have thrown something out there, but you wouldn't believe it. Not the actor. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's, I didn't catch, I didn't catch all of that. But what's that? So, for so easy, easy to remember, all the way up to grade five, we have six classes six in each grade. Okay. 
Okay. Then grades six, seven, eight, we have five classes in each grade. Okay. All right. Um, that's helpful to know. Um, but just so what is our, if I maybe you know this off the top of your head, how many kids do we have in each of like what's our average class size right now? It, it varies. I mean, I really we really focus on K5. Uh, and we, we are cautious with six to eight. We try to keep our numbers under 25 in all classes, and you know, anywhere from 23 to 25. As we continue to grow, we most likely will be faced with starting to add classes and, and at some grade. I can't guarantee it would be kindergarten to grade one at this point in time. But for sure, we're going we're gonna to have to be adding teachers in the next four or five years. Yeah, yeah. And high school, it, it, it varies uh, because of the number of courses that we offer. Uh, a teacher could have, you know, depending on the schedule, because there, there are so many offerings, a uh, chemistry teacher, for example, could have five students in one section and 25 in the next. Okay. Okay. You know, students, we obviously allow our students to choose courses that, that suit their needs. And as a result of that, we, we certainly can't stabilize enrollments in all of our classes. But, but uh, high school scheduling is just fascinating. So it's so complex. And with the change that we're making next year, having our, our music teachers stay at the high school is going to create so much flex, more flexibility. For, for our high school schedule is going to help our staff and help our students as well. Because band doesn't have to be the last class of the day or because band actually dictates the, the schedule. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's really intriguing how one course can, can dictate a it rolls half flexibility. <laughs> well, and, and it limits your flexibility in how you offer the other classes. Maybe the band. Yeah. Um. Yeah, no, that's good. That's good for me to know. So, like, we're we're trying to stay below twenty five, which seems twenty five seems like a big max. I know my first grader; she has twenty three, I believe, in her class, um, and it's a lot of it's a lot of kids. So, I just want to make sure as we're I know we need to bring in the school choice kids. I am a school choice kid. I would never want to turn any kids away, but I would never want to do that at the expense of making sure the staff has enough support and that the students have enough time, like one on one time with the teachers. Um, so 25 seems like a lot, but we're not there yet. <laughs> no, but I think one thing you have to take into account that in a lot of our classrooms, we do have other adults in those classrooms. So it, it may seem like a number that stands alone with, with one teacher, but some of our classrooms have two other assistants, three other assistants, and they just depend. So, yeah. and, and there are other supports throughout the day that, that have students going to uh, academic support centers, uh, literacy you know, uh, support centers etc so it's not it's, it's not static yeah yeah i think it's 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 easy to think it's static unless you're you're part of the school and you see the movement that happens during the day but we want to make sure that our classes are at a size where every child has has their needs met and you know the reality of of what we're dealing with is we we have to have enough students in the classroom to to Make sure that we can offer continue to offer what we do, and there was a time in our district where where the disparity between grades was was incredible. So we would be moving teachers around from year to year. So you'd have a teacher in grade two uh, because the enrollment dropped so much, we'd end up moving into grade three or grade one. So this has allowed us to stabilize our our, our teachers and the grades that they're in. So there's a lot to think about here. It, it's not uncommon to, to have 25 or under in classes, um, depending on where you go, uh, especially in the public school system. I, I spent, spent part of my career in, in another country, and I can tell you right now, it wasn't uncommon to, uh, when you, by the time you hit middle school, to have 33 students in a class. And standardized tests and tests that are used uh, really didn't show any any discrepancy in the learning opportunities for students. Like, in fact, the research clearly says it's the effectiveness of the teacher that makes the biggest difference. So, but, but we're cognizant of it. And I'm really cognizant of that. I'm, I, I'm not a fan of large class sizes. Never have been. Mm, and having yeah. taught in, in the class of in schools when I was a teacher, I had 44 students in my 49 math class. And, uh, it was a whole different experience. But that seemed to be the norm. For, for that particular 
school district. The lecture hall situation. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't like it. I, uh, I, a couple questions or just comments really. Like, I, I support the school choice numbers as laid out. I think um, it's important to note that we're graduating six and we're looking to bring six in to level, level it out. Um, maybe the easiest, like, Jason, how does 142 in sixth grade fit into the middle school? Because it looks like we're going to have some 142s or potentially even larger coming through in the next couple of years. Well, that's an excellent question. Because we've been working hard on it. Yeah, it, it took a long time, but would be easier right there. Uh, I think they can hear, pick okay. up from there, whatever you want. Um, what we did is in, in the past, we would normally hire a generalist, and so they would get a six certification and would then come in and teach one section of each subject. What we found in the in the short time that I've been at, at Lewis Middle School, we've had three different generalists. What we found is that the quality of instruction just isn't the same as what you would have if you had a dedicated teacher each subject. But having that six team member is critical to reduce class size. There just was no other way to do it with a five-person team. So working with our ELA department, they actually came up with an idea that that I, I wish I had thought of it myself. Um, one of the one of our special education teachers has been wanting to be an ELA teacher, certified or dealing and trained. And so it became why not why not create a second ELA class in sixth grade, a reading and a writing class, two separate classes that will be the bridge from elementary school into middle school while still providing some of those familiar supports from fifth grade, but also really more targeted, specific instruction. It solves the problem of class sizes because by adding that extra teacher, it, it, it reduces those. It increases the quality of instruction. Um, I think we can expect our, our, our students' ELA backgrounds and I mean, uh, experience to be um, undeniably better than, than most of these schools that I would be aware of in middle school. And it also allows us to keep this model moving forward. So instead of having a one-year generalist and having to hire as needed, we can build around this model that can become that 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 I hope to be permanent, so that we are ready to withstand any large group of students that may come our way as we as we as we anticipate they will. Is that based on having that one teacher having those specific trainings? It is a no. It's it, it, it it's a it's a wonderful benefit. Okay. That we are very lucky to be able to have someone in the building who one wants to to do this job, but also has that kind of right. training. That it's just it, it, it is it is a you know a sparkly lining to an already wonderful bow. That's not what I meant to say. But yeah. <laughs> 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 the mics didn't pick that up. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so actually, the one forty two, my mistake, is actually the class that showed up next year. So yes. you're, you're figuring that out right now. We're we've been yeah. I've been working on this since October. Yeah. Dr. Country challenged nice to hear. find a way to solve this problem without without costing the district an extra hundred k. We've done it, and I not not only did we do it, but I think we've ended up with something that's going to be better than what we experienced in previous years. Great, and not having to disassemble the middle school middle school approach to like <laughs> still accomplish planning times, still the rotation, still mixed classes, everything that. The middle school has to offer we were enhancing that now in sixth grade yep. um perhaps with these new start times we could advertise these seats at the high school and and get um get these school choice kids to show up i mean if they got to go to school earlier in other districts and they want to come here yeah. and start them, yeah. or it's just yeah. easier to, for the family to get them there yeah. by 805 as opposed yeah. to 715. Just putting that out there like a referral bonus to get some new kids um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but we have some seats and we, we now start at a more comfortable time. Um, since we're running out of controversial topics, I was just wondering about the the class size as it relates to the elementary school and wh what other previous school committees have discussed or maybe we should look at in the future is how, what to deal with this one transitional class. I know that just about everybody that goes into transitional has a wonderful experience. Um, but of note, you know, we're we're looking at a small sampling of children that just you know that we recommend they don't go on to first grade instead they go to transitional um i just was kind of wondering if we should be looking at how popular is this does surrounding communities still do it i mean i think back when we were kids it was called like pre-first 
or something like that. And I'm not sure that that is all that common anymore. And I just um, was thinking if at some point in time we made that transitional classroom, another first grade classroom, and then with smaller first grade classrooms. And then by the time they got to go on to second grade, yes, the classrooms would get a little bigger. But um, so just kind of putting that out there, food for thought, maybe just something to discuss next year as we we think about planning. I, I've been so thinking about that after you know, having, emails. had a discussion, <laughs> Justin. And yeah. I, I think you're, as we move forward with the increased enrollments, we're, we're going to see a, an opportunity or going to even use a necessity to revisit transition as, as our school continues to grow. Because I, I can't envision us having two transition classes as we grow. So I think that, that would be a kind of a turning point for, for our district in terms of how we move forward. I, I would see adding another kindergarten teacher or grade one teacher and then you know perhaps dissolving transition when we had that point in time. I mean, I can tell you uh, before we even do the research, uh, the number of transition classes that exist in the state has significantly decreased over time. But I still, in the position that we're in it right now, we, we hear a lot of good things about transition. And, and unless there's a a reason to do it, I, mean, you know, I, I just want to be sensitive to you know to to our community. I very seldom have run across a parent that had a child in transition that regrets it. What I have found at, at times, and when some of those students get to grade six, where where things are quite different. Sometimes they they begin to miss their peer groups because they still have a tendency to, to time stay with the peer groups that are the same uh, chronological age. Mm -hmm. It just seems to be a turning point in middle school, and that, that means more to them. But it's not a huge impediment. It's just sure. something we notice. Sure, and I don't, I, you know, I don't have personal vendetta against transitional or anything. I don't have a bone to pick with it. I'm just thinking, you know, it just again, food for thought. Mm -hmm. Something to put on our radar to think about as the class sizes continue to get bigger and shake our lane. Is there an easy way to, to make a change there to benefit the district? Yeah, I'd just say one thing this is my last time at this table. Uh, and so, one of the things I'd never known about a transitional program until I came to Little, we didn't have them growing up in Tennessee. Um, I really like it. And I like it for two reasons. One is, like you're saying, the families who've taken advantage of it have really benefited from it, I think, and the kids, I've seen them grow and thrive because of it. But the other thing is, it, it as I was trying to get a sense of how Littleton operated as a school system, as a community, it became clear to me there was never, I've never heard anybody associate someone with a transitional as stigmatized in any way. It's it's just, yeah, they were transitional, and, and now they're, you know, they're great behind, but we're still, it was just one of those things where there's never... There's never any stigma or ever any anything attached to it. It was just, yeah, someone needs a little more support for a little bit, and now we're moving forward. And that's the parent conversations, that's behind closed doors, it's the kids. It's just, it's one marker that was really important to me as I was getting to know this community of how welcoming this community could be and how um, accepting we could be. And, um, and I've just, I've always loved it in part because of that. Thank you for sharing. Sure. Well said. Do you need do you need a vote or anything on school choice, or we have consensus? No. Uh, it's fine. Just we we have consensus, so we we can move on. And, and thank you. Uh, this will definitely help as we're we're finding funding sources for, for some of the changes that we're making next year. Uh, just for your own knowledge, our our school choice uh, revenue this year is projected at four hundred and thirty thousand dollars, which is twenty thousand short of the income when we compare it to the year before. So. We, we did slide a bit, and, and we're just trying to try to watch that to make sure that we don't slide too fast as we continue to grow. What do we do to recruit new students? Is there any? You know, it, Stacey, it's, it's really interesting. Uh, people already know. We have waiting lists, questions. and people are already, they started phoning us a month ago. Yeah. So yeah. We, we really don't need to be putting big signs out. Or, yeah. You know, people people know about Littleton. Uh, they know what we have to offer. And, and, you know, we have a great reputation. And it's, are they coming from specific like areas, or is it kind of all over? It's it's actually a, the area that they're coming from is starting to grow. So it used to be you know the, the perimeter towns, but now we're finding that we have students coming from beyond the perimeter towns. 
And, and sometimes we'll find that, that those parents and one of the parents work uh, close to Littleton or drive through Littleton every day that you work, et cetera. So it makes it far more accessible for them to enroll their child here. I do think the start times may impact that. Uh, it mm -hmm. very well could. We'll see. Yeah. What yeah. is the revenue per school choice student? Around five thousand okay. dollars. Gotcha. Was that? Yes. Yeah. There are yeah. adjustments. Well, there are adjustments well, for there. special circumstances, but yes. Yeah. Okay. I suppose I could have done the math myself. You gave myself. Oh, that's all right. That's all right. Um, we good there? All right. Great. Thank you. All right. We've got a number of uh, new business items, which I think will end up going through pretty quickly. So the first of which is uh, high school tennis courts. So Steve Mark will discuss the potential. Um, addition of two tennis courts at the Littleton High School. Right, so um, this is gonna be more of a 50,000 foot discussion instead of fine details, but let me start with a couple of pictures. So um, foot view. this is uh, the 50,000, okay, here you go. This is the area of view of the current configuration of the tennis courts in the parking lot. Um, that's uh, it's this area here. I was not showing this, my mouse. Um, you can see the new Indian Hill building in the center um, on the left as well. So that's the current configuration. And then let me pull up this other picture real fast. So this would be uh, the... Um, this would be the target and the goal. Uh, so we're taking the, the two current tennis courts, reconfiguring them uh, to, to be side-by-side -side courts, uh, adding two additional courts. So we have a total of four courts. And then you can see uh, off to the, to the left, the ultimate goal would be um, add pickleball courts uh, over into the new uh, Indian Hill property. Uh, so uh, I want to acknowledge this is a park and rec um, slide. They put this together, park and rec. Um, Alicia Day and Tim Mahowski are really on the forefront of uh, pushing this project through. They are the ones working with the design team, uh, trying to finalize the numbers, trying to figure out the funding sources. Um, so they are really, uh, Tim and Alicia are really the ones uh, uh, moving this project forward uh, in collaboration uh, and with our recommendations and input as far as how it's going to work at the high school and, and things like that. So um, so having four courts at the high school would really benefit the high school tennis program. Uh, right now, we are, as we know, we have two courts. Uh, right now, uh, the high school program um, buses uh, the, the JV tennis team over to the current two courts over at um, the town hall. Uh, we know those courts are going away with the addition of the uh, senior center in that location. So there's really a need um, for high school tennis program as well as community programs to have uh, at least four tennis courts. Uh, it would be nice in this configuration. Uh, um, it, it certainly makes that tennis program much more viable for the high school. Uh, the, the goal also, um, notwithstanding the pickleball courts being installed, um, we're not sure how that's gonna fit into the funding and the phasing. Uh, so the, the plan right now is to uh, try to get the four tennis courts installed at the high school in this configuration, and then two of those courts would have pickleball lines painted on them uh, so the community could use those for pickleball um, uh, games and, and, you know, with those portable nets you put up. Um, See, I just want to make a, a clarification because I met with Parks and Rec as the liaison for the school committee. I believe if we don't have four courts in town for the high school to use, we cannot have a high school tennis team. That's correct. It's not that it would be an impediment, it's that we would have to lose high school That's tennis. correct, that's correct. So right now there are two tennis courts. Uh, the, the high school uh, has a uh, agreement with Weber Village, which is that new uh, senior development uh, right next to the entrance to the high school. Uh, Weber Village installed uh, two asphalt tennis courts over there that the high school can use. Uh, the surface on those is not optimal. Um, there are some issues with the surfacing on those courts. Um, it holds water. It's there, there are some, some undulations in the, in the surface. So they're not the best uh, courts to use. Um, 
but we there are two there are four courts theoretically there are four courts right now for the school to use um to, to make that program work but as i said the weber village courts are as uh the athletic director puts it um not very good <laughs> so um to the extent that we're actually busing jv kids to off-site courts right, correct, right, so correct. they must yeah. not be very good yeah. correct and I, I think that's what we're going to see unless you know we, we have a solution. Yeah, just a comment. I I don't know where the town is financially on this, but the fact that we're taking away two courts to to build a senior center, I'm, I'm hoping that there was some planning involved and in injecting money to to reestablish those those two two sets of so, so, so I don't have an answer. So I think there was, and I can follow up with select board or FinCom because if I recall two town meetings ago, there was a warrant to spend some money in front of um, Cooper Farm and they pulled it because they sort of realized that there might be some synergy with us wanting for two additional right. and then looking to spend money. And I think the number was like $1.2 million to put two tennis courts over by Cooper um, Farm. So why don't we reconnect on that? Um, Correct. So, that, so um, there there might be a possibility, and again, this is uh, Park and Rec is kind of leading the charge and know all the, the rules and ins and outs. There may be a possibility to use uh, CBC funds mm -hmm. for some of this. Uh, the, the additional funding would have to come from uh, another source. So... Um, you know, we're talking anywhere from, I'm going to throw out numbers from 700,000 to a million dollars uh, for this, depending on the options that get chosen, um, fence options, light options, things like that. Um, for the tennis courts alone? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And this is where the school buses park? That's currently where the school buses park, so we would have to um, also talk to the Conservation Commission and the and their, their where the where the water where the parking lot water flows to um commission i forgot the name of the commission uh reconfigure some of the islands um and maybe uh clean that parking lot up a little bit to make it more accessible to still park the buses there yeah a lot of work a lot of planning to still do and again i want to acknowledge uh alicia and and tim they're they're really leading the charge on this and um what's the timeline for this so they hope to have um, so they hope to have um, accurate numbers and kind of a more solidified plan, plan to bring to uh, the November uh, town meeting. Okay, uh, as a warrant article. Um, All right. Good. Yeah. Good. Any questions? All set. You don't need. Uh, to, nope. You'll come back with more information later. No. Yep. Perfect. Thanks Thank so much. You. Um, item number two here is a light pole request, the Russell Street track. So um, I can handle this one. I was contacted last week by one of the um, light commissioners in town who had fielded a request from some folks that use that Russell Street track. Uh, the concern there is especially in the fall when we start to lose daylight. I guess that back, sort of that back stretch that abuts the highway um, gets really dark. I think we can all attest to it. So it's likely a project that um, Littleton Light is going to look into um, the feasibility of it. They're not asking us to pay for anything. They were just simply asking that in the event that they wanted to move forward and they were going to sync a singular light pole, um, telephone pole type style with solar lights up top, we would there would be no expense to us. Um, we're not talking high voltage. It's not going to replicate what's at alumni field or anything. It's more of just a, a safety so you don't trip. Um, they just wanted our, our permission to move forward because it, the poll would go in on school grounds. That sounds great. Yeah. Sounds like a great idea. You know, um, especially if it doesn't cost anything, but it'd be great. It's great for public safety. It's great for events. That spot can get pretty isolated. Sure. Um, you need a vote. I think I would like a vote on this one just so we can get it in the minutes. So uh, any other discussion on this topic? To entertain a motion. I'll move that the school committee um, get permission to LE, LWD, LWD, um, to um, 
to install a light pole near the rest of the street track if they deem it necessary at no cost to the school committee. Motion <laughs> second. Made and second. Uh, all those in favor to keep by saying aye. 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 Opposed? None. Mark that as unanimous. Thank you. Uh, third topic, we've got the MASC delegate form. The school committee will determine if a member will attend the MASC conference as the delegate representative in November 2023. You want to handle the intro on this one? Yeah, the MASC, MASS, uh, Superintendent Association, has a joint conference every fall. And uh, one, of, one of the meetings is, is a delegate assembly where they take a look at resolutions uh, that um, actually drive the, the mission of the MASC. And uh, every school district has an opportunity to have one member of the school committee be part of that process. It's a three-day conference and uh, lots of good information in terms of professional development for school committee members and a good opportunity to uh, meet uh, colleagues uh, in other districts that have similar challenges to what we have. Around the table. I think it sounds really important. I think all the members of the school pay you <laughs> You're not interested, Brad? I'm not going to be otherwise, I would. Yeah. Okay. So, can go to you. Uh, uh, so it's November. I'll say yes. on the Cape. It's a three yes. day thing, but I don't think you really have to be there for all three days. No. I mean, you could, if you could, it'd be great, but you can pick and choose your spots. Yep. Um, anybody jumping out of there? We don't also go. We don't, we don't have, have to make a decision session. now, and, and uh, just wanted to bring it to your attention. And I know well, everybody's busy and you have full time jobs, etc. But yeah, you know, sometimes uh, you can swing it going down for a day or, or half a day, even uh, give you an opportunity to to meet other colleagues and, and uh, share experiences with each other. I remember Tim Owen went and really got a lot out of it, and yeah. then I helped her as a new committee member as well, which this whole committee is still, <laughs> yeah. That's, I think it's a nice intro. Why don't we get some information out? And sure. then if folks are interested, just go right there, Kelly, if you're so it's always good. Good. Okay. And I'll consider it myself. I haven't been. Yeah. Um, last topic here for new business is the handbook update. Uh, Director of Student Services, Lynn Snow, will provide an update on additional language recommended for handbooks with a potential motion, except the new language. Just because I felt like we weren't done with the handbooks that I missed. Let's get it in. <laughs> so um, just to give a little bit of context, the handbooks um, through the TFM process were completely overhauled and updated. Um, they were approved by DESI and then right before our feedback report um, was received, we um, did receive from our reviewer supervisor that there was some additional language that they wanted specifically in our disciplinary procedures for students with disabilities section. It's all language that is existing in the regulations. It's all um, things that the district is um, typically doing, but they wanted specifically called out in uh, the language of the handbook. So uh, I created a document just to highlight. I have on the left side the whole, um, the whole section and on the right side of the changes. So you'll be able to see um, just specifically what the language changes are or additions. And then I can just explain what that means. Um, so for the first one, we are uh, deleting the language, determine the relationship between the student's disability and the conduct for which the student is subject to discipline is called a manifestation determination that he must convene within 10 days of the decision to suspend. There's additional language that we need to have um, that speaks to reviewing all relevant information in the student's file, including the IEP and teacher observations and any relevant information from the parents to determine whether the behavior was caused by or had a direct and substantial relationship to the disability or was the direct result of the district's failure to implement the IEP, a manifestation determination. So it's expanded language. Um, the next section is um, additional language, and that just speaks to the need to provide parents with a copy of the procedural safeguards no later than the date of the decision to take disciplinary action. And then um, if you can scroll down, there's just additional language in the last, in the last section. And the last section is um, specifically about when a request is made for an evaluation of a student's eligibility. 
So the ad addition there is that if prior to the disciplinary action, the school district had knowledge that the student may be a student with a disability, they've received the protections under, under child fund. The district will make all the protections available to the student, for instance, a manifestation determination until and unless the student is subsequently determined to not be eligible. The district may be considered to have, have prior knowledge if um, the parent had expressed concern in writing. So for instance, if a parent had expressed concern that their child might have a disability, if they had requested an evaluation, um, and the district had expressed directly to the special ed director or other supervisory personnel specific concerns about a pattern of behavior demonstrated by the student. The district may not be considered to have had prior knowledge if the parent has had not had not consented to the evaluation um, or has refused special education services or if the evaluation resulted in a determination of in ineligibility. The one question I had about that in writing, are we talking about pen and paper or are we talking is an e with an email account? Pen and paper, email, scratched okay. on a back of a okay. post-it, any anything yeah. other than verbal. Yes, okay. yeah, it's it needs document. to be in, in exactly. some form of, of writing. Gotcha. Yeah, Thank but you. definitely email. Um, and then it just there's an additional sentence that says if the student is found eligible, he or she received all the procedural protections subsequent to the finding of eligibility. So even if, if a student is still um, in process, they are entitled to the protections under. Great. This language, this specific language was suggested to us by reminding me. So this that. language is all in the regulations. Okay. And so typically when you have a handbook, you're just summarizing the regulations, but um, they wanted us to summarize it with a, those additions with that additional detail and language um, high highlighted and called out. That'll be helpful for parents. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, and it's it, it's now um, in all of the handbooks. Yeah, and just just so you know, I mean, we we went through this process. We involved our our attorney. We went through all of our handbooks, uh, verified we had everything. We talked to the individual that was in charge of our TFM. He was also satisfied. We had it rubber stamped and brought it to you as a school committee to vote on it and move forward. And then lo and behold, at the very tail end of the process, they go, oops. Yes, Deffy sure loves to keep things exciting for me. <laughs> so it's, it's atypical, but it, it, it happened. And it is, um, it's language that has, um, the language that we have is language that has been has been approved previously many times, many districts. So um, I think this is just a, an emphasis or a focus that Desi wants to have language in. Um, I'm certainly comfortable with all of it being called out for sure. Great. No other discussion or questions? Move, move forward with the motion. If we have a blank, like, the language of the motion is just to approve the additional language. Okay, yeah. And I move to approve the additional language of the handbook as, as presented. As presented. Motion made. Second. Seconded. All those in favor of the paper saying aye. 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 Opposed? Not. Mark that unanimous. Thank you very much. Thank Good you. job. All right. This is our second opportunity for interested citizens. So if we have anyone in the room or anybody on Zoom that would like to speak before the school committee, this is your chance and your last chance at Brad. <laughs> we do not. <laughs> All right. We'll move on to subcommittee reports. Uh, PMBC? Nothing new to update. I'm just working on the roof come June by high school. So great. Um, budget subcommittee. Budget subcommittee is happy to report that the school department's budget was approved at uh, town meeting Monday evening. Um, of note, our budget was held, meaning that there were follow up questions, which only related to a seventy one thousand dollars spend for sidewalks, sidewalk repairs, which the school department has agreed to consult with. Um, it was like a the yeah, the disabilities yeah. commission um, on the work that we're going to be doing there. So nice work there. Um, and also um, we had said that we would like sort of begin the process with that additional school resource officer. So a couple conversations with um, Chief Bernard. Um, the plan is to um, consult back and forth in terms of one another's budget and the need. And perhaps if we determine that there is a need, um, the path was likely to bring it to town meeting to see if the town would like to support a, uh, an additional school resource offer. That, that seems to be the, the, the current idea. Okay. Fair enough. Um, policy subcommittee. 
nothing to report other than to give my apologies to this committee. I had intended to bring to us um, an updated policy about, uh, I think, what was it? The, it was about the, the uh, vacation, not vacation, the religious, holiday. the religious holidays and looking how other people worded it um, and get stronger language to make sure about student work for days. Um, I got caught up in the negotiating team and just didn't get to it. I apologize. Sorry for no, no worries. When we reorganize, we can make that a priority. Yeah. Um, understood. Um, so without any further business, we could, we do have a need for exactly like, one thing about CPAC. Of course. Just that. Um, <laughs> no, sorry. No, just that CPAC, um, you know, when now's the time when a lot of parents are starting to, uh, to think about next year and thinking about their IEPs and five and fours. A lot of teams are revisiting. Um, you can always reach out to parents can always reach out to their liaisons. And CPAC is um, going to be holding elections, I think, in June. If I and um, and um, we've been we benefited greatly from having a viable, active CPAC for the last several years. Um, the leadership is stepping aside; they've done their turn. Um, and so, people who might want to look for places by the leadership in town, that's a really important way to do it, and invite people to do so. Absolutely, yeah. terrific! Thanks so much. Um, so before we adjourn, we do have a need for executive session. So we've got a special motion for that. But uh, our next regularly scheduled meeting is May 18th, 7 p.m. Um, however, just putting this out there, there's a possible need for a meeting next week, which will be May 11th. Um, it all depends upon the ratification of the teacher's contract and some information that we'd like to share if we're able to do so. So we'll post... 48 hours ahead of time if, if necessary, but we're we're hopeful or we're optimistic that um, there would be a need for a meeting next week. So without any further business, um, I'm just gonna make the motion. So I'll, I'll motion to move to executive session for the purposes of contract negotiation um, and to consider the release of executive session minutes with no intention return to open session. Second. Motion made, second in. Um, this, this can just be a regular vote, I think. Yes. Yeah, thanks. Uh, all those in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? None. We are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.